Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So welcome and good evening. Uh, this is the third Dean's Lecture for 2019. And the Dean quite sadly sends his apologies as he isn't able to be here to introduce the event tonight, but he has had to travel interstate for a family funeral. So he sends his best wishes, Diane. And um, yeah, I have this precious opportunity, which I am really thrilled um, to have. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Deputy Dean. I'm Professor Helen Cahill. I'm also the Director of the Youth Research Centre and a Professor in Student Wellbeing here in the School of Education. And so you can hear my special interest in Diane's work. But before we begin, I'd like to uh, pay respects and start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet for this session today. And I pay my respect to their elders and past and present and to members of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect also to all Indigenous persons in the room with us tonight. With that said, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Diane Bella Broderick. This lecture is very timely from Diane. Given that today is the university's Mental Health Day, which aims to highlight the importance of looking after ourselves and looking after each other, particularly in the area of mental health. It's also a very special night for Diane. She will be delivering her inaugural professorial lecture, quite some time after attaining her professorship, which has continued to flourish through her great intelligence, hard work and commitment and creativity. Diane has a very special place and a very special position in the school. She currently holds the Jerry Higgins Chair in Positive Psychology. She's the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Centre for Positive Psychology. And these are very illustrious and esteemed positions. For a little bit of history and not to take too long, Diane is a registered psychologist, but she has achieved many firsts within her field. She was the inaugural director of the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program. She founded the Positive Psychology Network in Australia, and she's been the first editor-in-chief of the journal Psychology of Wellbeing, Theory, Research and Practice. Diane also serves on numerous research advisory boards, and she's received over $3 million of funding for her research, which includes the development and evaluation of wellbeing programs particularly in the areas of positive psychology and performance optimization. She specializes in mixed methods design, which uses the latest technology, experience sampling method, and biological indices of well-being. Her research specifically focuses on young people, and we'll hear more about that tonight. But there's one other marker of Diane's great um, esteem and great contribution as a research scholar. And that lies in the fact that she, in her career already, has supervised over 50 higher degree research students and set them on their research journeys, which is a great accomplishment and contribution. So it's my very great pleasure to welcome Diane to deliver her Dean's lecture on wellbeing education that feels like a treat rather than a treatment plan. Diane. Thanks so much, Helen. Thank you everyone. It's just wonderful to see so many smiling faces that have come out tonight. And I'm really excited to be able to share with you uh, some of the learnings that I've had over the many years that I've been involved in trying to promote the well-being of young people and, um, and people more generally too. And I suppose the roles have been quite diverse. If you think back from when I started my career, probably close to 30 years ago, um, where I was a fitness instructor and then a psychologist and then I've been involved in research from both um, a program develop developer as well as an evaluator and of course in my role as a parent I've had a lot to do with trying to understand um, the well-being of young people. And so I've been fortunate um, to gain a lot of insights uh, across those different roles and that's led me to come up with a few ideas and to develop a framework that I'm actually calling uh, the TREAT uh, framework. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. But before I do share that, I actually would like to thank a few important people. And um, my journey hasn't been solo. I've had a lot of people help along the way and I want to thank you so much for that. 
as you've heard, um, the Higgins family has been very um, generous in supporting the Centre for Positive Psychology and funding the appointment of the Jerry Higgins Chair in Positive Psychology, which I'm really fortunate to be holding for the next few years. Um, and there are a range of people, my wonderful research team who are here tonight, thank you so much for all the hard work um, and the support staff, but also the schools that have been involved in my research, um, both the staff and the students, I'm ever so grateful to them, and my wonderful PhD students who help um, contribute to the broader research program. So a big thank you to everyone. Okay, I'm going to start with a personal story, just to give you a bit of I suppose a journey about what place wellbeing uh, education has had in schools. And this is my own personal story and I'm calling it my allergy. Now I'll take you back to when I was about 11 or 12 years of age and I was in grade 6 uh, at a primary school in the northern suburbs and um, it was a time of my life. I loved grade 6. I felt like I belonged in school, I was really eager to learn, I loved sport and I had a really good friendship group. And then the year was over and I had to go into high school. And I went into high school with none of my friends from primary school and the transition I found really, really difficult. And I suppose the greatest challenge that I found during that time um, was developing new friendships. And so I found that when I was at school, it was very lonely for me. And a lot of the time I'd wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I wonder who I'm going to sit next to in class today. And that would be my anxiety. And that detracted from me actually wanting to learn and from me actually wanting to go to school. So you can imagine if you're in that sort of situation uh, that I was particularly excited about the school holidays. When it was time for school holidays, that was a big relief for me. And in particular, I had a favourite auntie. And this auntie uh, said to me, come and spend the school holidays with me. Come overnight uh, for the two weeks and I will spoil you rotten. And she did. I remember having outings and daily butterscotch milkshakes, which were a real treat for me, and for her giving me her wonderful home cooking. So for a couple of weeks, I had a really, really good time. I felt like I was loved and cared for. And then, of course, it was inevitable that I had to return to school. So when I returned to school on the first day back at term, I remember feeling absolutely miserable. And I went to class. It was an English class. And I sat in the class and I was overwhelmed with sadness to the point where I started crying in class. Um, inconsolably in many ways. The, the tears were just streaming down. And halfway through the class, the teacher stopped the class and said, Diane, are you all right? And I remember panicking because I was trying to conceal the fact that I was actually really sad. And I didn't want people to know that I was crying. So I just responded by saying, I don't know what's happening, but my eyes are just watering up. Okay, so at this point, the teacher just went and got some tissues, put the tissue box beside me and continued with the class. I started crying even more and so I was wiping my eyes with the tissues and of course this aggravated my eyes even more. They were irritable, red, swollen. And so by the time the class was over, the teacher came up to me and said, you don't look very good, Diane. Your eyes are really swollen and red and I think you should go home, try and recover. So I went home and it felt good to be home. And I was allowed to stay home for a couple of days, but then I had to go back to school. So when I went back to school, I started crying again. So my eyes got red again. And this time, because again, I didn't want to admit that I was crying. There was something wrong with my eyes. They were just watering up. Um, at that point, the teachers in the school thought that maybe I was having an allergic reaction <laughs> and that there were some bushes in the school ground that were causing this. <laughs> I, of course, went along with it. I got sent home because I can't stay in that environment. And so at home, it was great again. 
I wasn't crying anymore, I had adjusted, but I realised I don't have to go to school when I have this condition. So what did I do? I hatched a plan. Very unlike me to be deceptive, but I was on this occasion. And what I did was I actually put makeup around my eyes to mimic the um, irritation. And so at that point, my parents became quite concerned that there really was an allergic reaction. I ended up going to a couple of doctors each time, putting makeup around my eyes. They were none the wiser. <laughs> none the wiser. And what happened? They referred me to the Royal Children's Hospital <laughs> to have allergy tests, which I went, believe it or not. <laughs> I actually went with makeup around my eyes, having an allergy test. I wasn't allergic to anything except school. And so, would you believe this happened over the course of about three months? And I was sent to another school to, to see if the environment would be better there. And I was off school for three months. Okay, what was the point of telling you this story? Well, that really got me to reflect on. At no point was I really asked either by my parents, by school leaders, by teachers, whether I was actually okay. All they could see was the red swollen eyes and they made assumptions that it was a physical condition. And so that led me to think that I really didn't have any support and I didn't know how to cope. So I had issues, emotional issues, because I was very, very sad. Um, I had issues to do with forming relationships and I don't think the education system helped guide me in ways to be able to manage that situation. And so at this point, I ask myself, I wonder if I was in that situation and I was at school now, would the response be the same? Would the teachers and the school staff and the parents treat me in the same way? And would my response be the same? Or would I have better coping strategies? And so this is where I often reflect, what do schools do? Can they do more? And schools do a lot. I'm not here to try and criticise the amazing work that's done there. And there are so many services that they do offer, in ranging from counselling services to suicide response and prevention services. There's pastoral care. And more and more schools are now really engaging with a number of wellbeing types of programs um, to not only mitigate sort of mental illness, but to really try and foster wellbeing and resilience as well. And so there are so many different um, resilience workshops. And in more recent years, um, with the inception of positive education, that's really starting to have an impact as well. And so, okay, generally speaking with wellbeing programs, what are the sorts of things that are being covered in these programs? There are things like pro-social behaviours. So, um, expressing kindness and gratitude and forgiveness, um, as well as being mindful, um, understanding your strengths and the strengths of other people and being able to leverage those for your own good, but also the greater good. Um, teaching people to be hopeful through a range of different interventions like best possible self. Um, and learning about different mindsets and the full range of emotions and how they can be really helpful. These are the sorts of things that are covered in many of the more comprehensive wellbeing and positive education types of programs. Now that sounds terrific, doesn't it? And I know that with my particular issue that I raised um, in my story, I think that would have been really helpful because quality connections and learning how to express your emotions um, might have been very useful for me. So, in theory, it sounds great. <coughs> and so many people, when I describe the area that I work in, will say to me, especially if they're a little bit older, um, I wish I learnt this when I was at school. 
And that's what I sort of say to myself as well. I wish I had have learnt this earlier <coughs> so I could have used it throughout my life. But you know what? The message isn't always that favourable. And like I said in my introduction, I am so lucky to be able to visit schools, talk to teachers, talk to students, and get a real world sort of perspective of what's going on in schools. And I get mixed responses. Sometimes people say, look, learning about wellbeing is boring. It's irrelevant, it's not practical enough, it's this airy-fairy thing. And it really depends on the teacher as to how good it's going to be. And then you get others saying, look, it's OK. Might help me later in life. It's OK, it's better than maths, it's relaxing. Um, parts of it are good. And some people say it's really important stuff. We need to know this for the future. And you know, some of those comments, it depends on who you're asking. If you ask a teacher, it might be different if you ask a student, particularly if there's a teacher who's heavily invested in wanting to deliver and promote well-being. So I don't think that the responses from those that sit in the well-being classes are always 100% favourable. And we need to take that into account. Another really key striking, um, I think, insight for me is that I'm surprised when I ask students about how they use the learnings um, from classes of wellbeing in their everyday life, and they struggle. And it's not just asking them. We actually use a number of different methods, and one in particular is called experience sampling methodology, um, where our participants um, or students download an app and we prompt them a few times a day for perhaps over the period of a week and ask them <coughs> what they're doing, how they're feeling in terms of their emotional state, whether they feel energised um, and what's been happening to them and how they're responding to those situations. And we're trying to get an understanding of whether they're actually applying some of the learnings from wellbeing classes um, or positive education classes into the real world. And we find that a lot of them struggle. It's great, some people can do it, but it's not the majority. And so to me, I think what's really important is that we need to have an applied well-being in order for it to make an impact. And I'm not 100% convinced that at this point in time, we genuinely have an applied well-being. It doesn't mean we can't get there though. And that's what I've really been trying to do in the work that I've been working on recently. And so for me, I really want to figure out ways in which we can make learning about wellbeing more real, engaging and personalised for young people. Because then they might be more interested in wellbeing and therefore interest means that they're more likely to practice well-being and then apply it when they need it in the real world. So this is where I've come up with my TREAT framework. And I like to say um, that we want to make learning about well-being a treat, not a treatment plan, because it's not really about just trying to remove negative experiences. Um, but that it should be an enjoyable process about learning lifelong skills that are going to really make a difference to their life and it's going to feel like a treat for them. <coughs> and so TREAT stands for tangible, relevant, evidence-based, alluring and transformational. And so when I was talking about the real engaging and personalised, um, they're the broader concepts and the TREAT model fits in under um, those three broad categories. So I'm going to go through um, and give you some <coughs> examples of what I mean by the TREAT framework and just get you to consider whether in your practice, if you do work with young people and you're involved in trying to promote wellbeing in some way, um, whether you could apply some of these um, features from the TREAT model um, to help with the learning process. Now, 
I'm actually going to be using, um, by way of illustration, a program that I've been working on. So while I've come up with this treat concept, I don't want it to stay a concept. I actually have been working um, with Brighton Grammar School. I've been very fortunate to have spent last year um, co-designing this program um, with a number of boys there. Uh, and we're evaluating the program at the rolling out and evaluating the program at the moment. And this program is designed to have those treat features embedded within it. And so um, it's just in the trialling stage at the moment, um, but let me describe a little bit of what it is because I'll be using it as an illustration. So the BioDash program uh, is all about designing a wellbeing program and a performance optimization program that teaches young people about different wellbeing strategies. And they include things like deep breathing, um, mental imagery, mindfulness, and emotion regulation based on things like savouring um, and listening to music. And they're taught these different interventions alongside feedback tools, and in particular, biofeedback. So while they're learning these strategies, they're actually getting information about how their physiology is responding to these interventions. In other words, if they're doing deep breathing, what actually happens to their respiration rate? What happens to their heart rate? What happens to their skin temperature and their brain activity? And they're asked to practice these um, strategies using different challenges. And they might be mimicking real world challenges and they might be games. And those games use gamification features. And you'll get to see what I mean by that in a moment. So that's a bit of an overview of the BioDash program. So let's talk about how we can make learning about wellbeing, in particular wellbeing programs, more tangible. And, you know, it's easy to be misled by a smile. It's easy to be misled by a red, irritated eye. But at the end of the day, we need to really think about how we can make the intangible or seemingly intangible more tangible because that's what gets the attention. That's the reality. In my story, no one could see beyond the red eye. And so it's very important that we use the latest science and technology to help us make the internal world more tangible. And so we teach young people about things like what happens in the brain, brain waves, and that it ranges from gamma right down to delta. Gamma is a very busy um, brain activity stage. Um, beta is sort of the pretty average normal state. Alpha is a more relaxed state. And then as you go down, it's more into the sleep states. And that this is what the brain waves look like. And normally, this brain activity <coughs> happens without your deliberate control. It just happens. Just like breathing, it just happens. It's not like you have to do something to make it happen. However, to learn that you can actually regulate to some extent these things can be very empowering. And that's where we do use um, brain sensors that enable young people to get real world, in the moment, information about what's happening in their brain and to connect it with what they're doing and to try and understand when I do X, this is what happens with my brain activity. And that's under normal circumstances. And when I try doing this intervention because I want to try and relax, what impact does that have on my brain activity? And that's making the process more tangible. Ordinarily, it might be guesswork, trying to anticipate what's going on rather than seeing what's going on. So this is called biofeedback. It gives you a window to the internal processes, and that can be really insightful. And so I want to give you another example of how we can make well-being more tangible. And I'm going to use an example from positive education. It's called active constructive responding. 
and it's designed to teach you a little bit about communication styles and how you might be able to enhance good quality relationships. The premise of active constructive responding is that you need to think about how you respond to people when they share good news with you, okay? And apparently, how you respond to people's good news is very important, almost more important than how you respond to people's bad news. Um, and it is apparently, according to research by Shelley Gable and other colleagues, um, it is indicative of how long your relationship is going to last, in particularly marriages. So, <laughs> so listen very carefully to see what uh, response style you have. So, um, there are four main types of response styles. And I'm not going to go into them in a lot of detail, but just to give you an idea, the best one, if you want to have a longer relationship, is to engage in the active constructive response style. So when someone gives you good news, that you're animated, you're enthusiastic about what you're hearing, you're praising, you're saying to them, you've worked so hard, you deserve that. And you're very authentic in your response. And you want to hear more and you want to celebrate. The other styles, like the passive, um, you're pretty low energy, yeah, that's great. Or, you know, if you're in the destructive mode, you just sort of start talking about yourself and almost ignore the good news, <laughs> you know. Um, and then you get the destructive types. They're very constructive, but they're destructive. They're like, really? You think that's good news? You're going to be so tired. You're not going to be at home very much and so on. So um, you get the gist of the four um, <coughs> different communication styles. What's interesting though, is if you're realistic about it, we probably engage in all four. We might like to think that we are active, constructive all the time, but how do we make this more tangible? So normally in a classroom, you might learn about the different styles. In a classroom, you might even get an opportunity to practice the different styles of responding and you know, um, role play. But I wonder, if that's tangible enough. So I'm suggesting that one thing that could be done is you could be saying to students, okay, over the course of the next week, I want you to record every night who has provided you with good news and how you've responded to it. And to actually put initials in the quadrant that you think represents how you've responded to them. And this means that you're starting to collect data over the course of a week and you start to see patterns. For example, you'll see that this person does have a fairly active, active constructive response style, um, particularly with D and S, whoever they are. Um, they're very good at being active and constructive. But poor J, <laughs> pretty passive responses to poor J. And poor M, uh, well, M's sort of a bit of a mixed bag, but can get a bad deal too sometimes with the active destructive. So this makes the information more tangible. It gives you data to be able to go, okay, this is how it's relevant to me. I've heard about it from a theoretical perspective, but this is my life. I can see it, and now I can make decisions about what I want to do to change it, if indeed I do want to change it. And then you could take the recording again a week later, um, if you think you're making the changes, to see what difference it's made. Also, we have things like I was saying before, the experience sampling methodology. This is such an effective way of being able to collect data. We ask questions about people's well-being, about their energy levels, and over time, you know, it's so quick to get this information and it's so familiar, especially to younger people. In 90 seconds, we can capture so much information um, about their well-being, about their mood states, about what they're doing, and then they can start to see relationships. When I'm with these people or when I'm doing this, this is my mood. And then they get to know a lot more about themselves. And these apps and tools 
that I must say take a lot of time to develop and quite a bit of money um, invested in them can consolidate a lot of information for the user and give them that tangible feedback that they can make decisions about their life. Okay, the other important feature I think of wellbeing programs is to make them relevant. So, we all know at school in so many subjects, only in math problems can you buy 60 cantaloupes and no one asks what the hell is wrong with you? You know, um, this is so true. Students are not stupid or gullible, they want examples that they can relate to. And we really need to think about making the wellbeing programs that we deliver and we get them to sit in class and sit through the whole time relevant to them. So this is where I say, who best to ask about the relevance of a program than the target group? And here we're talking about young people, why not ask them if they feel that it's relevant? And it's not enough in my view to just go, oh, we're the experts, let's come up with a program and let's just ask the students if they like it or not. But let's get them involved from the very beginning, from the design stage right through to the evaluation stage. Let's get them invested. Let's get them thinking this is really, really worthwhile. And then I think we start to get a program that's relevant, that's genuinely relevant. Because remember, I sort of alluded to it a few slides ago, young people's perceptions and teachers or adults' perceptions don't always line up. And we've got to figure out where the gaps are and what we're going to do about it. And so with the BioDash program, we actually want to make sure that it's relevant for them. So storytelling is absolutely critical. We need to weave an important story that makes them think learning about wellbeing is going to make a difference to me and my life, so I'm going to listen. And so we've surveyed and spoken with young people and we know that school-aged children, particularly secondary school-aged children, care about how they're going academically, care about sort of hobbies and leisure interests, so sporting and performing arts, and they care about social events and activities. And so if we try and link wellbeing to the things they care about, then it's going to be more relevant for them. And this is where we also try and link the strategies that we teach in the wellbeing programs um, around three key areas that they also claim um, make sense to them. They want to learn how to relax, they want to learn how to focus, and they want to hype themselves up and motivate themselves sometimes. And so what we've done is we've developed this dashboard for them whereby they can really think about their personal plan. And they don't have to create something in every cell of that dashboard, but only the ones that are relevant to them. So if they find, you know, sitting an exam very stressful, then maybe they need some relaxation techniques. And so when we teach relaxation techniques, particularly things like deep breathing, we can say this can really work in that type of scenario. With the biofeedback, they can get some information about whether or not it works for them personally. And then they can be putting that strategy in that cell to say, okay, I know that I want to manage stress before an exam and I've tried these five techniques and the one that seems to resonate best for me is the 4-4 deep breathing and that's what I'm going to try. And so then it gives them confidence that they've got a plan and it's personalised and it's their choice. It's not us going, you are going to have to do A, B and C today in class. And that sense of autonomy makes such a difference to being engaged in learning. Also, we try and show young people the real world relevance. Imagine being a student in a class and the teacher has presented a lot of information and then the teacher starts asking questions at random to the students in the group. 
that's pretty stressful. You're not quite sure if you're going to be selected to answer a question. You're not sure if you even know the answer to the question. You're concerned that you might make a fool of yourself. And so you're sitting in class, your heart rate is racing a million miles an hour. You might start getting sweaty and very nervous. And so this is quite normal. And so if we actually showed students what happens to them because they're wearing portable devices, measuring their heart rate, measuring their brain activity, etc., and they can see how crazy your body is going in moments like that. And that it's quite normal that almost everybody in the class is feeling the same thing. But then to say, if you actively tried a relaxation strategy or a focusing strategy um, that you are comfortable with to see if you can mitigate that, let's see what happens. And it's amazing that they often can control some of that nervous tension, some of that physiology with simple techniques. And for them to actually see it in front of them because they're wearing the devices, they're getting the biofeedback in the moment and they're saying, oh, it does make a difference when I try um, a particular technique, um, you know, mental imagery or breathing or trying to be mindful to stay grounded. Um, and it's not saying that they're not going to experience any of that heightened um, arousal that takes place. That's important. That's a natural part of being human and responding to stimuli in your environment. But things like being able to recover quickly from stressful events is very important. You don't want to be in that stressed state for prolonged periods of time because it's having wear and tear on your body and on your psychological state as well, which then hampers your ability to perform in areas that matter to you, like academics, like the sport and artistic and in social sort of situations. So that's what you're always trying to do. Weave the story um, that they care about and demonstrate to them what happens in their real world. And it's very powerful. So the other feature of the treat is the evidence-based. So when I talk about evidence, I'm really referring to a couple of different types of evidence. Yes, there's the empirical evidence, the scientific, but there's also um, the real world evidence, how practice actually informs the science. And they're interdependent and two-way. And so I'll give you a couple of examples of how that might look in uh, a learning environment. So let's imagine that you're trying to teach mindfulness to a group of boys. Can be quite challenging. Ch mindfulness is challenging at the best of times. And, um, it takes a lot of practice to become comfortable and to start to see the benefits of mindfulness. And so you're trying to teach mindfulness and um, some people enjoy it, some people less so. And you might bring in some research findings. So there was a study done by Felicia Huppert and her colleague Johnston with secondary school boys. Um, some of the boys received mindfulness training and some did not. And they looked at what the outcomes of that um, program were in terms of whether uh, the boys were more mindful after the program and whether they had um, improved their levels of well-being. It was actually found that there was no difference between the two groups. However, when you singled out the boys in the intervention group that had the mindfulness, the boys who actually practice mindfulness outside of class time, that's where the relationship was with improved mindfulness and improved well-being. So you could talk about that research in trying to illustrate the point that you need to practice if you want to derive the benefits from these interventions. And so that's where science informs practice. But then, for example, with mental imagery, you can be talking about the practical aspects of mental imagery. And did you actually know that with mental imagery, it's the number one intervention that sports psychologists use with professional athletes? So 
Sports psychologists think that it works. Um, and not only that, you can cite lots of professional athletes like Andy Murray, um, tennis player, who uses mental imagery um, and is a big, big advocate of it. So you might refer to some of the athletes that your target group might know of and say that they swear by it and they found, find it helpful because. Okay? So there are examples of how you might use the two types of evidence in the way you deliver um, the information and try and sell the importance of what they're learning in terms of their well-being. We also want to make learning about well-being alluring. And you know, if we want them to practice it, it needs to be compelling in some way. And what do people, especially young people, find alluring? Technology, games and challenges. They like variety and they want to know more about themselves. So let's not fight it. Let's build it in so that we can promote well-being in young people. And how do we do that? Well, with technology. They love gadgets like this. They're amazing. The technology that's available today is portable. The top one measures brain activity. The middle one is a um, respiration monitor that just hooks onto your waistband. And the bottom one measures galvanic skin response, which is um, skin conductance and body temperature. They're readily available devices um, that provide feedback <coughs> to um, people. They're familiar with these types of tools. It gives them a bit more variety and novelty in terms of learning about well-being rather than the standard of sitting in a classroom and learning from textbooks. Um, and it's cutting edge. Young people are fast moving. They like cutting edge things. They often want the latest phones, etc. So we've got to do the same with well-being. And so these are the sorts of things that we use um, to try and allure young people to learn about well-being. And so this is an example where we're measuring their physiological responses. And um, this is an app that's downloaded. And what they're asked to do is to transform the winter landscape on your left side um, to a summer landscape. And so as you become more relaxed, you start to see the transformation. The ice and snow starts to melt, and the grass and greenness starts to come up um, in the summer side and you start to see beautiful streams uh, and you get information about whether you're in the um, green zone, amber zone or red zone in terms of relaxation to stress states. And the thing is, <coughs> the faster <coughs> you can do it, that's the target. And speed, how do you get more speed? By relaxing more. So they're asked to try and apply different interventions that they've learnt to help them relax and it helps them get it faster. This is another example where we start to introduce a challenge now. So this is a competition where they're a dragon and they're racing another dragon and the aim is to finish um, before the other dragon. And so again, um, with the ability to be able to relax, it means that you can fly faster. So it gives them an incentive to actually really try and relax. After each of those um, activities, they get really tangible information about how they've um, performed. So they get information, for example, about what percentage of the time when they were doing that task, they were in the relaxed zone compared with the neutral zone, compared with the stress zone. And having those metrics means that they've got something to work, work towards. They know that when they did it the first time using this particular relaxation strategy um, that maybe it was a bit harder but with more practice they're getting faster and faster. Or they can just try out different types of um, interventions to see which one works for them. Not every intervention is going to work for everyone the same and that's the beauty of doing things like this, that it's personalised. They also get gamification features. So um, in relation to if they've been able to be in a calm state for a certain <coughs> period of time, they start to hear birds singing or they start to get different points, you know, calm points. 
And these become important to them. These types of reward systems are very much a part of young people's lives and are um, massive incentives for them. I find myself getting dragged into these sorts of things. It's not just for young people. Um, you get excited when you get more birds than you've been able to be calm and relaxed. So the other thing is we want our wellbeing um, programs to be transformational. It's not enough just for it to be working at that one point in time. It really needs to have lasting change and lasting change of two types. And one is at the micro level where it's really making a difference to the individual involved and helping with certain um, issues that they might be having or just building their resilience and their capabilities um, to live a, a very functional and well life. But, and this can shine through in so many different ways in being able to communicate about wellbeing. And you know, that's where I think back to my first example and I say to myself, I wish I was more literate in wellbeing. I could have expressed myself better when I was sad. Um, but you need the whole environment to be embracing of that for you to be able to be one, versed in the language and two, comfortable in expressing the language so that you can feel that you're supported. Um, and you know, then to display that in your behaviour as well, um, to really adopt some of the wellbeing strategies, like I was talking about before, the applied wellbeing needs to be present. And then you might start to see outcomes at an individual level. But then social impact is also very, very important. And this is at the macro level. And this is where, um, you know, I've got an example here of showing individual transformation. And when we talk about, for example, breathing, and they go, breathing? That's so basic. But when you can show them that they can transform themselves just through something as basic as breathing, it's very powerful. And so I'll give you an example here. This is a little video um, of an individual who started with about 17, 18, 19 breaths per minute, okay? The average is about 15 um, in a normal sort of um, average state. And um, the more relaxed you are, the less breaths per minute you have. And so what I asked this individual to do was just to breathe normally for the first 20 seconds or so, and then to apply a breathing technique. And the breathing technique was inhale for four seconds, pause, and then exhale for four seconds and keep repeating that. And so let's see how they go. So you can see that their breathing rate is a bit erratic. It's rising slightly here. Um, and then in a few seconds, they're asked to try and apply the breathing technique. And um, so at about this point, they're starting to apply the breathing technique. And you can see that their breathing, average breathing rate is starting to go down. Um, and within a matter of about one minute, they're able to at least halve their breathing rate from 19 breaths as their high per minute, right down to about eight breaths per minute. And if, well, they did actually go for longer, but I stopped the video recording, they were, they were able to get it down to four breaths per minute. So think about the implications of that. If you're feeling really, really stressed before a sporting performance, before an exam, how good is that technique? Um, and, you know, there's evidence to show that if you've got the reduced breathing, um, you're really um, exhaling stale air and carbon dioxide and breathing in fresh oxygenated air, which means you can focus a lot more. So it is to your advantage. And how quickly can you do that? And that, if you show, if you get them to try it and they can see that for them, how powerful. Talking a bit more now on the broader macro level, this is my vision that we can connect the mind and body and that we can be thinking about mind fitness hubs just like we talk about physical fitness hubs. 
and that they can go hand in hand when someone wants to go and do a workout, it can be a complete workout. If they're training for a sporting event, why not train psychologically? Get themselves in the right state of mind as well as their um, peak physical fitness. And I think this can be done. This is something that should be attainable. So, I'm working on a triple treat. It's not enough for me to have just one treat because at the Centre for Positive Psychology, we're very much about systems. And we know that a program alone, no matter how much of a treat that program is, it's just not enough. We really need to think about nurturing the qualities of the participants so that they're ready to receive the program and the environment so that it's supportive. So keep an eye out for more information about my triple treat in the very near future. But I want to sort of finish up with another story, this time not my own personal story, but one that you might have heard of in the past by Hans Christian Andersen. And it's called The Emperor's New Clothes. For those of you who are not familiar with the story, I'm going to give you a very quick summary. So the emperor, he loved fancy clothes. And he knew he had a big event, a big procession coming up in a little while. And he'd heard that there were some amazing weavers coming to town. And these weavers claim that they have the most amazing thread and cloth that um, is able to detect whether you're fit for your job or not. And if the thread is invisible to you, that means you're not fit for your job, you're incompetent and you're stupid. But if you can see the beautiful cloth, it means the contrary. So of course, he very much wanted this unique um, thread and cloth and commissioned the two weavers to um, produce the most beautiful suit for him for the procession. And away they worked, he said to them, just ask for how much, however much gold you need so that you can buy you know, the thread. And he gave them a, a place in the palace and they were pretending to be weaving away and producing this amazing suit. So the emperor um, <coughs> asks one of his ministers to go in and check how the suit is progressing. The minister walks into the room and gasps because he realises that he doesn't see anything but he doesn't want to admit. After all, he is the minister of the emperor and he wouldn't want anyone to think that he was unfit for his job. So he pretended that he could see the, the workings of the most beautiful garment. And he went running off to the emperor and told the emperor, it's looking fantastic, you're gonna be so happy. So then the emperor had to have his fitting because the suit was pretty much finished. And in he went, and lo and behold, the same thing. He could not see a suit on the loom. And, but he did not want to admit. Imagine the emperor not being able to see the suit and being described as unfit for his job. So he stayed quiet. He stood there, the weavers pretending to put this garment on him. And to the point where he actually wore the suit to the procession. The members did not say anything. Everyone pretended as if they could see the suit. No one wanted to look stupid, except for one person, a little child who said, the emperor is wearing nothing at all. So why have I told you this story? Well, this is my link of wellbeing education and how it's similar to this story. I think just like the pretend suit, is there a pretend well-being education? Now, I know this is controversial, and I certainly don't want to disrespect all the hard work that goes into well-being education in schools today. We've all been involved um, in trying to make a difference, and I think it's been a terrific start. But sometimes it's also under the guise of mental illness, not necessarily mental well-being. So it's just a question that I pose. Just like some of the Emperor's staff, I think there are people who want to turn a blind eye to the reality, to thinking that there is an amazing wellbeing program there. Um, 
and that we don't really need to do much more. And this might be because it's convenient for them. And I know, and I think it's less so um, in more recent times, but there's been a controversy about what place <coughs> is there for wellbeing education in schools. Are schools really designed for academic education alone? And so sometimes it's convenient to go, oh yeah, yeah, it's all good. Just like the emperor, I think the leaders of our education system don't want to admit that there is very little there too. They need to tick the boxes. And if you can use labels, that's great. But what's underlying those labels is very, very important. So wellbeing in schools, in my opinion at least, I think the threads are there. And there's some beautiful threads. Beautiful threads from different disciplines, from educators, from psychologists, from counsellors, pastoral care. But I don't think the new suit has been fully weaved yet. And we need to do more to address wellbeing, education, at a systems level. So I think that we've been making a difference to maybe a school, to maybe some students, a class of students, there's no doubt about that. I've seen transformations before my eyes when I visit schools, and I'm so proud. But if you think about our education system, at a macro level, we have not done enough. Not every young person in Australia has got access to good wellbeing education. It's inconsistent. And so I think by approaching wellbeing education using something like the TREAT framework that I'm proposing, it means that young people might want to learn and practice wellbeing skills. Then they'll retain it more and they can apply it throughout their life. And then if we have that macro level support, it means that they'll feel better supported, motivated and confident in managing and promoting their mental health. At the end of the day, young people, especially in secondary school, of secondary school age, actually do want to be more independent. They do want to be able to manage their well-being. They often are reticent to go and seek help from external sources. And it's our responsibility to actually equip them with the right ways, ways that are collaborative, that they can adopt to help manage their life. And so I pose the question, this is certainly my vision, and I don't know how many of you share this vision, but do you think we've gotten to this? That wellbeing education should strive to equip, inspire, and em empower young people to be proactively involved in shaping their own wellbeing destiny. I think a lot of the time, students sit in classrooms, they listen, they try and be respectful, they try and take what they can that may or may not be relevant, but is it inspirational and empowering? Not often enough from my perspective. So my major goal is I'd love to see every young person have a wellbeing plan, a wellbeing plan that includes elements of being engaging, that includes elements of being personalised and is tangible and credible for them. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Diane, and on behalf of our audience and all the other audiences who will um, enjoy your lecture, thanks for giving us such a treat. Thanks for having the courage that the 11-year-old could not have access to, to actually tell the story with honesty. And thanks for sharing us that through line in your life quest, which of course is a journey from one treat to triple treats, we can hear that, um, which shows us your fascination with biofeedback, having been taught about biofeedback very early by your eyes. <laughs> Thanks for teaching us about rigour in research evidence because you knew how to fake it and discovered that faking the evidence is no way to move from an allergy plan to a wellbeing plan. So um, thank you for all those insights you've provided from your research experience in schools, your fascination with providing lots of support tools to help people to understand themselves and to communicate their wellbeing needs and capacities and skills with others.
So we do know you're fascinated by the triple treat as well, so we'll be waiting for it, because you did tell us, triple treat, butterscotch milkshakes, time with auntie, and holidays, it was definitely triple treating. So we're looking forward to the triple treat lecture that will follow this one, All right. and we encourage you to, put, to go forth and multiply your treats. <laughs> Thank you very much. And on behalf of the Graduate School of Education, I'd like to present you with this memento, uh, so something you can take and share with pride. Thank so well you. done. Thank you so much.